Now we get to my favorite, what might be my favorite election in American history. You, you may not have a favorite election in American history, but I've got a few. As the Americans continue to move west into places like Texas and Oregon, it creates uh, more and more pressure to annex these states, the, these areas, and let them become states. In 1844, Henry Clay is going to get the Whig nomination, uh, and he refuses to take a stand on Texas. He does, simply doesn't talk about westward expansion or annexing these territories. And this is okay if you're a Whig because the Whigs don't like expansion. Westerners tend to vote for Democrats, and so the Whigs see expansion as, as bad for them. Now, Martin Van Buren, who wants to get the Democratic nomination, also refuses to take a stand on the annexation of Texas. And uh, while he is the assumed nominee, when it gets to the convention, he can't get a majority of votes. Now, at the convention, they're going to vote more than 100 times uh, and be unable to choose a nominee. James K. Polk, who had served 14 years in the House, for his speaker, is from Tennessee, had also been the governor of Tennessee, but it was at the time retired, and he was fairly young, he was uh, in his mid-40s, will stand up to speak on behalf of another nominee. He's not running for president. He has no intention of becoming president. And he will speak, you know, nominate my friend. He's great. You should nominate him. And then at the end of the speech, he says, oh, and by the way, we should annex Texas and annex Oregon. And the place goes crazy. Um, and on this idea of manifest destiny, of, of spreading west, uh, Polk is going to win the nomination. Um, he's also, in fact, going to win the election and become the president uh, beginning in 1845. Uh, his slogan in the campaign will be 5440 or fight. Uh, and if we go back here a couple of slides, we can see that slide on Oregon. Um, the, 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 what most people assumed would happen is, this, this, uh, uh, is that, that Oregon would be split in half. But 5440 or fight meant that we were going to tell Britain we wanted the whole thing. You see at the top is the 5440 parallel. Uh, in reality, though, Polk will settle on the 49th parallel, um, and so 54-40 or fight kind of tends to be a lot of talk. Uh, <laughs> but, of course, we also have to get uh, Texas. Now, that's difficult because Mexico clearly does not want us to have Texas. We've been trying to buy it for a while now. Um, Texas annexation, uh, when, when John Tyler actually annexes Texas, and Tyler, who wanted to annex Texas anyway, um, is going to say, well, they elected Polk on the promise that he was going to annex Texas, so why wait? I'm going to go ahead and do it. And so that's how Texas comes into the Union. Uh, Mexico breaks off all diplomatic relations with America, and tensions begin to rise between the two countries. Texas claims that the Rio Grande is the border, of course, which we all think of it as today. But the Mexicans claim that the Nueces River is the border. You see the Nueces River uh, where that green line is. And so the green area here is area claimed by both Texas and Mexico, or now the U.S. and Mexico. Polk wants a war with Mexico, and so he's going to create a war with Mexico. He sends a general, Zachary Taylor, um, old rough and ready as you see him here, um, down to protect Texas and originally tells Taylor to set up on the, on the Nueces River, on the border that, that, that Mexico claims. Um, Texas, New Mexico, and California all have more whites than Mexicans. Uh, the economy is in almost entirely based on trade with America. Um, and, and so their attitude is, we have more in common with America, we should join America. Of course, um, the Mexicans don't see it that way. Polk, at the same time, will send John C. Fremont, a, a bizarre, extravagant explorer, uh, to California to begin gaining support in California for a rebellion. Now, California, of course, is owned by Mexico, and nobody disputes that. He also sends the Navy to sit off the coast of California. So he's going to pretend here in a minute that the Mexican-American War just happened, uh, but in reality he is preparing for it uh, meticulously. Polk will uh, ask Mexico to sell him uh, the land that he wants and, and give up their claim to Texas. Mexico, of course, refuses. And then Polk sends Taylor to the Rio Grande. Now, notice what he's done here. From the eyes of the Mexicans, this is an invasion of Mexican territory. But from the eyes of, of America, this is Texas territory, so Taylor's done nothing wrong. So he's playing a little game here. But Mexico knows that a war with America won't go well for them, and so they do nothing. Until um, uh, May of 1846, when Taylor reports that he has been shot at by Mexican soldiers. Uh, this may or may not be true. Uh, there's a, uh, it's perfectly reasonable to believe that Polk got tired of waiting and just told Taylor to lie and claim he had been shot at. Uh, but, of course, nobody really knows today if it happened or not. It doesn't really matter because it became the pretense, it became the excuse uh, to declare war on Mexico. Um, 
And so on May 13, 1846, we'll begin the Mexican-American War. Whigs are horrified by this. They oppose it, but they vote for it anyway because we're claiming our guys have been shot at and they don't want to seem weak. No politician wants to say, let's not fight back when we get attacked. So the Whigs are kind of forced to support it, which is going to happen over and over again in history, by the way. Um, everybody, or the Whigs all say, Polk did this on purpose. This, this isn't a real war. Polk invented this war, and they're probably right. Uh, Zachary Taylor invades Mexico and takes Monterey, um, and Polk begins to suspect that Taylor... Um, is politically ambitious and wants to use his success as a general to run against Polk in the 1848 presidential election. Uh, this may or may not have been true at the time. Taylor is not a particularly bright man, uh, but he is politically ambitious, So, uh, but we'll get back to Taylor. In the summer of 1846, Stephen W. Kearney captures Santa Fe. There is no opposition. There are no Mexican troops there, and then continues on to California. In California, Fremont, remember he had been sent there, um, will we'll, we'll gather his settlers, a surprising number of which are former U.S. military soldiers who had recently retired, um, who just happened to be there. Uh, Fremont raises the bear flag over uh, California, declares the bear flag republic that you see there, and the U.S. Navy, which just, oh, by the way, happens to be sitting right off the coast of California, will help Fremont seize control of California. Kearney shows up, uh, he's a, a, a U.S. officer, and takes control and completes the conquest of California. And this will become the new model for U.S. expansion. We go into an area, we get the people there to rebel, and then we just show up magically, uh, because we were sitting there waiting, and declare that we're there to protect the people against their evil government, and then we take the land. We're going to do this over and over and over again over the coming decades. In Mexico, the focus turns to Winfield Scott's army. Uh, Taylor has been fired because Polk fears that he will beat him in the election of 1848. Taylor was, never lost. He was totally successful. He wasn't fired for doing anything wrong. He was fired for becoming too popular. Uh, Winfield Scott will invade at Veracruz using the, uh, uh, the Marines. Um, he'll hit Tampico first. You see this line down here in the Gulf of Mexico. And then he'll come in through Veracruz, which will surprise the, the Mexicans. He'll take an army of 14,000, and he'll march right down a highway to Mexico City. Uh, he suffers very few casualties. He never loses a battle. And uh, Mexicans begin revolting in the capital, in the F.A., in Mexico City, um, uh, before Scott even gets there. And so it's very easy for Scott to take the capital. A new government gets put into place and uh, 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 asks for peace. Polk desperately wants to end the war before the election of 1848. He sees the war as he, he wants to be able to declare a successful war when he's running for re-election instead of being bogged down in a war. Um, there's a lot of talk of us just taking all of Mexico, the whole thing. Uh, and he sends Nicholas Trist down to negotiate a treaty. Uh, but really because we're in a hurry as much as anything, um, we settle for the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, on February 2nd of 1848. We're going to take California, New Mexico, um, as well as Arizona, Utah, Nevada, all those states there you see on that map. Um, and they're going to become part of the United States. The Rio Grande uh, will be the border for Texas, as we're familiar with today. We'll assume all the government debt in the new land. So we assume all Texas debt and, and whatever uh, uh, provisional uh, government debt there is in these other areas. We give Mexico $15 million for the privilege of stealing half their land, so that's nice. Uh, Polk is attacked by expansionists for not taking all of Mexico. He's a, it's actually a, a, a kind of a political crisis for him. They're like, why didn't you take the whole thing? And he's, of course, attacked by free soilers, who, including people like Henry David Thoreau, who see this whole thing as a plot to extend slavery into uh, the American Southwest. Uh, Polk, of course, is a southern slave owner. Uh, and that's the, the Mexican-American War. Uh, 